Welcome to the LS Community Church Podcast. We're a church located in Lee Summit, Missouri, that is dedicated to making disciple makers who saturate our city and the world with the gospel. For more information, check out our website at lsccc.org. Thanks for listening. A psychologist at the uh, University of Aberdeen had looked into the, uh, the experience of being forgotten, and they studied how it uh, damaged and impacted relationships. Uh, one of the scientists, a psychologist who was on this research team, uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Uh, Devin Ray, he said this, scientists have been studying what we remember and forget for decades, but no one has asked why it matters if someone remembers or forgets another person. And so they kind of dove into the psychology of how that feels to people. And here's one of the main findings in their research. They had a whole list, but here's one of them I thought was, was interesting. Being forgotten affects the closeness of relationships because the forgotten person infers that they are less important to the person who has forgotten them. Maybe you have experienced this in your life. Maybe you have experienced this feeling of being forgotten in a marriage that's not doing so hot right now. Maybe you've experienced this with a close friend, somebody you thought was going to be with you through thick and thin, but it just kind of feels like maybe, maybe they've just kind of forgotten. Things have cooled off just a little bit. Maybe it's a, a family member and just, man, it's not quite right, and I just feel like they've kind of cut it, and there's this, this, this distance and a forgottenness, maybe in being overlooked, and man, I just, something is off in the relationship with this particular person. Maybe you can resonate with that, maybe not, but the truth of the matter is that many of us could say we resonate with this when it comes to the idea of our relationship with God. Because many times we feel as if God has forgotten us. If you've been a Christian for seven seconds or longer, you've come to a point where you're like, God, you remember like we're supposed to be in this together, right? I mean, it happens all the time. The person that uh, you work with, they get the promotion and you didn't. But you've worked there three years longer and you're just like, God, what are you doing? Like that was my promotion. That was supposed to be my next big career move and you've just given it to somebody else. You remember I'm out here? Do you remember I'm trying? Do you, have you forgotten me? I thought we were in this together. You know, that person over there, the neighbor, they move, they get a nicer house. You're like, man, I'd, man, I'd love to have a house like that. That'd be really nice. Speaking of nice houses, Mahomes just built a house on the Lake of the Ozarks. Whew. Man, it's a nice looking house. <laughs> the neighbor down the street got a new truck, and your work truck has been falling apart. It's rusty. You've needed a new truck for years. You can't afford it, but the new neighbor down the street, they got a new truck, and you really wish you could have a truck. God, have you forgotten me? I'm like, I'm barely getting by here. I need a truck for work. Did you forget about me over here? Maybe it's the person who just seemingly has a better family life and from the outside, uh, kind of the, the inside looking out there, you look at the family over there and you go, man, God, I think you just forgotten my family. Like we're, we're falling apart and they seem to have it all together and every social media post, they're on vacation again. And why do they have it so good? And everything in my world's falling apart. Did you forget about me? I thought you made promises to me too. Or maybe you're just like, 31 other NFL teams who watch the Chiefs play every week. And you're like, God, you forget about us? He's like, yeah, I did. Yeah. Too bad for you, pal. Giving trophies to God's people. I don't know if that's how God really does it, but that's how it feels right now. And I'll, I'll ride that high for as long as possible. Just tell you that right now. If you're just joining us, maybe for the very first time, we've been in a series of messages walking through uh, this Old Testament story, this book called Esther. And over the last few weeks, the story has really been speeding up. The first couple of chapters take place over like a 12-year span of time. It's kind of slow. It's a buildup. And then the last few chapters have taken place in a matter of days and in some of the moments, a matter of hours 
I mean, the story is speeding up. The tension is there. It's full of uh, unstable characters with massive egos, humble Jewish folk. I mean, it is, it just, the story has everything you could possibly want. And then last week in our story, uh, when Jack spoke, last week what happened in the story was that two plots collided. And the, just the main pivotal moment of the story happened last Sunday. These two plots collided. One to, uh, to execute Mordecai and then the other for Queen Esther to say, hey, could you please not kill us? And so one who wants to execute Jews and one that does not want to execute Jews and those two stories collided last week and the entire story pivoted on chapter six and seven. Now, we're going to be in chapter 8 today, but I wanted to kind of outline the book for you because there's a literary uh, structure to the book of Esther that is intentional and is on on purpose, and the the writer wants you to get what's happening here. And so there's going to be a lot of words on the screen. This may be a really good time for you to take out your phone and take a picture because this, th- there's a lot of words, but I want you to see the flow of the story. As each indentation happens, that's the story moving forward. Okay, chapters one through six and seven, the story is moving forward. And then last week when the story pivots, it absolutely shifts and there's a reversal in the story and it just all starts going back the opposite direction. And that is on purpose. The writer did this on purpose. For instance, The splendor of the Persian king and the two banquets. You remember we talked about that? All they did for the first chapter was get drunk and party. That's like the whole first chapter is one giant party for months and months on end. It's just that's what they did. Uh, Esther becomes queen. Mordecai saves the king from the assassination plot, remember? Haman is elevated to power. And that's where the plot begins to thicken because Haman does not like the Jews. Haman's decree then to destroy the Jewish people. Esther and Mordecai now start to move into position to try to reverse that decree. And then Esther hosts a banquet with the king and Haman. And that's where you kind of see those, those, these two plans beginning to collide. Esther's trying to host banquets to save the Jewish people. Haman's showing up at the banquets trying to execute the Jewish people. And so these two stories are just, I mean, they're coming together like a train wreck, and that's what happened last week. The pivotal moment, what what we'll call just this kind of pivot place in the middle of the story, is that Haman, who is the enemy of the Jews, is humiliated and Mordecai is exalted. And there's just this shift that happens because previously Haman has had all of the authority, all of the rights, the signet ring, all of the glory, all of the honor, everybody bow to him, and all of a sudden in the story it shifts. And now watch as the story starts to work its way backwards, how all of these little moments mirror each other all the way back. Okay, this is intentional, all right? Somebody didn't write this by accident, okay? Watch it go backwards. Esther's second banquet, and Haman is executed. So from the first banquet where Haman had plans to execute Mordecai, now there's a second banquet as the story works its way in reverse, And there's a banquet and Haman is executed, not Mordecai. And then these next three lines, this is where we are today. If you were at the mall looking at a, you know, trying to find your way around, this would be the directory map with the sign that says you are here. Okay? You're in these next three lines. Esther and Mordecai plan to reverse the decree. That was the plan from a few chapters back. They're trying to figure out how to undo this work. It, It mirrors itself. You can see both lines are the exact same. Mordecai's counter decree to save the Jewish people mirrors what? Haman's decree to destroy the Jewish people. It just mirrors itself working right back out. This is just literary genius as this story is being put together. Mordecai's counter decree to save the Jewish people is now kind of put into place. Uh, And then Mordecai is elevated to power when back in chapters one and two, Haman was elevated to power. Next Sunday, you'll get the last two. You'll see how they all fit. Next week, we'll conclude it. But you can see how the story is, has moved. Just drama, tension, drama, tension, pivot point, and now it's just reversing itself back out. 
And so as we near the end of the story, you can see the entire thing just shifting and doing a 180 and headed in the other direction. The problem is that it's not over because drama and tension still exist. So everything is seemingly headed the right way, but there's still some tension we have to work through. And one of those tensions is, God, have you forgotten us? Because there is a decree in place to exterminate the Jewish people in the Persian Empire. And so the tension is still there. God, do you remember us? And this is really the big idea from chapter 8. And maybe the best encouragement I could possibly give some of you today is simply that God remembers his people and his promises. If you're here today and you're like, God, I feel like you've forgotten me, man, I've got some really good news for you. God, God remembers. He remembers you. He remembers his people. He remembers his promises. So we open chapter 8. And as we get into chapter eight, we're brought into a scene where Esther and Mordecai are actually together. So if you're just joining us, Esther is queen of Persia. She's a Jewish woman. Uh, Mordecai is her uncle. Uh, and they've kind of been working together uh, somewhat subversively underneath all of the story. And now they're actually being able to come together and work together. Like everything is starting to shift. And they begin to work their plan to reverse the genocidal decree. So uh, King Xerxes, at this point, chapter 8, has awarded uh, Haman's estate to Queen Esther, uh, the signet ring that had all the power. When you signed a decree with the king's signet ring, it was law. You could never change it. It just was. Uh, it just is how it is in that moment. Uh, that signet ring has moved from Haman now to Mordecai. Now, a few chapters ago, when we got to that first banquet with Esther, uh, or just before the first banquet, when the king sees Esther out in the courtyard, and he's like, oh yeah, I like her. You should come up here and talk to me. How you doing, honey? You know, like uh, this whole thing happens right there. When that happens, and she goes up, she's like, okay, I, I, wanna, have, I wanna have this banquet. I need to talk to you. And he says, up to half my kingdom, it's yours. So when chapter eight opens and he's given over Haman's estate and he's given over the signet ring, the king, uh, King Xerxes is likely thinking, I fulfilled my part of that vow. Up to half the kingdom. Okay, here's this huge estate. Here's the signet ring. You now have power. That's just how it's going to be. But Esther pushes for another request because the, the decree to wipe out the Jews is still in effect. So this is what Esther does in verse five. She said, if it pleases the king and I have found favor with him, if the matter seems right to the king and I am pleasing in his eyes, let a royal edict be written. Let it revoke the documents, the scheming Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how could I bear to see the disaster that would come on my people? How could I bear to see the destruction of my relatives? King Xerxes, if you're new, long story, Ahasuerus is way, it's just too hard to say. Xerxes is easier, it's, call it a nickname. King Xerxes said to Esther, the queen, and to Mordecai the Jew, look, I have given Haman's estate to Esther. And he was hanged on the gallows because he attacked the Jews. He's like, I've already given you something. I hung the guy that wanted to kill you. The signal ring's turned over. You've got the estate. I've already given you something, and yet you're asking me for more. And he says, write in the king's name whatever pleases you concerning the Jews. Seal it with the signet ring. But a document written in the king's name and sealed with the ring cannot be revoked. In other words, you're still on the docket to die. You're still going to die. Your people are going to die. There's coming a day. The dice have been rolled. The edict has been written. It's been signed. It's been sealed. It's been delivered. You are going to die on March 13th. That was the day. And you're all going to be wiped out. There's nothing I can do about that. I've given you some stuff. You better go and write something that saves you because I can't undo what has already been done. Now, I don't want to read too much into the Bible here, but the first thing that I notice is this really interesting thing about Esther. Esther is not just a beauty queen. Girl knows how to play chess. As she knows, Xerxes is full of himself. He's impulsive. 
He's got an ego the size of the Persian Empire, maybe bigger. And she plays him like a fiddle. While he's probably drunk again and playing chess, she just starts moving the pieces on the board and just works some magic. I mean, the language that she uses, right? If it pleases the king, if I have found favor with you, if the matter seems right to you, if I am pleasing in your eyes, pleasing in his eyes, there was a four-year beauty pageant 12 years ago looking for you. You walked in the room and the king went, shut it down, that one. You're pleasing in his eyes, okay? We got it. But she uses that against him and she's just, she's just playing chess now. And, and, and he's just getting run all around. She's done all of that and more and once again she steps into her authority as queen. And she starts making moves. The king's like, I've done what I thought I was supposed to do. Executed Haman, you've got the estate. I can't do anything else you and Mordecai are gonna have to figure this thing out. Now, if to this point in the story, Esther and Mordecai, along with all the Jewish people, if at any point along the way they've ever had the thought, God has forgotten us here in Persia. God has forgotten us, he's left us to die. These are the moments in the story where we would say, we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. So they're, they're kind of sitting back in the story going, okay, I, I think God maybe hasn't forgotten this yet. There's some light at the end of the tunnel. I think God is still up to something here. And you can see the story begin to reverse itself back the other way. And the Jewish people are starting to think, maybe God hasn't forgotten us after all. So Mordecai goes to work. It's, at, it's kind of at this point in the story that seems like Mordecai takes over the the main uh, efforts here at this point, uh, he, goes, uh, he, he goes to work uh, writing a counter decree. He goes to work putting this actual document together. So the story's momentum is going the other way. Mordecai is leading the way. Haman is out of the picture. And Mordecai's response is, we need a new decree that balances out, that, that, that kind of uh, cancels out the previous decree and so here's, here's, what we're going, here's what we're going to do. Esther chapter eight, starting in verse nine. The edict was written for each province, this new uh, edict that, that Mordecai is working on. The edict was written for each province in its own script for each ethnic group in its own language and to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in King Xerxes' name and sealed the edicts with the royal signet ring. He sent the documents by mounted couriers who rode fast horses bred in the royal stables. And the king's edict gave the Jews, it doesn't even say if the king actually knows what he said. The, the king gave a ring to Mordecai, said, you guys figure it out, but it's in the king's name, so it's his decree. The king's edict gave the Jews in each and every city the right to assemble and defend themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate every ethnic and provincial army hostile to them, including women and children if need be, and to take their possessions as spoils of war. This would take place on a single day Throughout all the provinces of King Xerxes on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month Adar. March 13th for us. Now, if you've been with us through the story uh, thus far, uh, you may remember back in chapter 3 when, uh, uh, when Haman put together that edict as well, when he put together his, his decree to exterminate the Jewish people. And if you were to read these two edicts side by side, uh, the way that they're written, uh, they would almost be word for word just in the opposite direction. There's a couple of really interesting things here uh, that mirror themselves again in the story. And the first one is that line back up in verse 9 where it says, and to the Jews in their own script and language. 
If you go read what Mordecai did in chapter, th- or uh, Haman did in chapter three with his decree, he doesn't write it to the Jews in their own language because he doesn't care about the Jews. He's trying to exterminate them. So it says that there's an edict written, it goes out in all the scripts and all the languages, but just not the Jews. Too bad, you guys are gonna have to figure it out on your own because I'm not putting this in your language. And so it's added here that Mordecai is like, yeah, well, I care about the Jews. And so when I write this decree, we're also gonna include a copy in a language we understand, in something we can use to defend ourselves. That's an interesting note, just an interesting little piece of information. The second one is how Mordecai sends the information. It says, uh, he sent them on mounted couriers who rode fast horses, bred in the royal stables. Now again, this is a, a difference from chapter three, where in chapter three, the decree was written and it just gets sent out. But in this case, uh, Mordecai employs what m- might be viewed as like the, the king's postal service Like it's a higher end version, fast horses, royalty. Like there's this this kind of sense of urgency in the language. In fact, if you keep reading down through verse 14, it says that they carried an urgent command. Now there's a a few dates that I I don't have the, the timeline exactly lined up, but you're talking about a matter of days, maybe a week, week and a half, since all of this stuff has started to fall apart and new edicts are being written, it's a very short period of time. And so the idea that you're supposed to get from the reality that Mordecai sends out fast horses bred in the royal stables is you, you want to imagine that the other guys with the bad news, they've got a, a weak head start heading out to all the provinces to spread the news. The the idea we get here is that Mordecai is trying to catch them with fast horses so that the news arrives in all the provinces on the same day or roughly close. So he's trying to make up for lost time. That's the image we get here, okay? Now, as he's doing that, basically what he wants is he wants someone to open the first decree and go, hey guys, gonna have a kill day on March 13th. All the Jews gots to go. Oh, second decree, but they get to fight back. It's kind of the idea. So Mordecai's trying to catch up uh, and make up ground so that everybody knows, yeah, you, you can fight them if you want to. They're going to fight back. And they have the right to. The king has signed off on all of this. So that's the really big question that comes with this, how do you reverse an irreversible edict The best way to do it, Mordecai can think of, is self-defense. Anyone who comes up against us, we have the right to fight you back. And again, it is identical language. If you go back to the decree written in chapter 3, they are given the right to extinguish the Jews, men, women, children, destroy, kill, annihilate, and take all their stuff. It's It's the exact same language. And Mordecai goes, okay, fine. Well, when we go to defend ourselves on that day, we have the right to destroy, kill, annihilate men, women, children when we get the spoils of war. It's the exact same decree in the opposite opposite direction. So if the Jews are starting to feel like, hey, we think maybe God has forgotten us, this decree is meant to say, I haven't forgotten you. I remember, I'm still here, Remember, Esther, God doesn't appear in the book. He he is not mentioned. There's no naming of God in the story. The only book of the Bible that does this. It's a fascinating read as we seek to find God hiding in plain sight. As we seek to find God working in the coincidences and the flow of everyday life when he's not named, we work to find him in the silence. And here the Jewish people are starting to hear him again in the silence. We thought we were gonna die. We thought God had forgotten us, but maybe, just maybe, God still remembers the promises he made to us. That God maybe hasn't forgotten us yet. 
And then in one last area, we see uh, here in chapter eight, as all this begins to come together, you see kind of one final area where you would be able to say, God has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten his promises made to the Jewish people. And you would say that because Mordecai is now elevated to a position of power. Mordecai is elevated to a position of power. Now, uh, he's, you can uh, kind of juxtapose him with, with Haman, and it's really interesting because Haman attempts to elevate himself to positions of power and influence and authority, but he does it all through pride and ego, uh, commands, rules. Remember, the king had to command people to bow to him. Uh, if, if you have to command people to show you respect, you don't have any. You, you don't have any. If the king has to command it, if we have to demand that you show respect to someone, that person doesn't have it. So he's trying to get it through pride, through power, through laws, through his ego. And now here we are with Mordecai who is elevated to Haman's same position, a position of power and influence and authority. The difference is Mordecai got there through faithfulness and humility and diligent work. And God is not mentioned, and yet you would say, man, God just, God is just setting this up. You can just, you can see him working in the Jewish people. You can see him working through Mordecai as he seats him into a position of power at just the right time to defend the Jewish people. And so God is constantly at work, and now Mordecai is elevated to a position of Power. And here's kind of how we see that play out toward the end of chapter 8, starting in verse 15. Mordecai went from the king's presence. So they've had this whole conversation, right? The king's like, you're going to have to do it. I thought I gave you enough, but it wasn't. So you guys got to write a thing. Uh, Mordecai's gotten to work with the scribes. They've written a thing. They've sent it out. And now Mordecai is leaving the palace. Okay, so this has all happened very quickly. Mordecai went from the king's presence clothed in royal blue and white with a great gold crown and a purple robe of fine linen. <laughs> Dude was looking good. He, that's, these are some fresh dreads. Like he, he's, he's looking good. I mean, threads are nice on this guy right here. The city of Susa shouted and rejoiced and the Jews celebrated with gladness and joy and Honor in every province, in every city where the king's command and edict reached, gladness and joy took place among the Jews. There was a celebration, there was a holiday, and many of the ethnic groups of the land professed themselves to be Jews because fear of the Jews had overcome them. Now, let's let's work our way back through this again. It's just just hang out in the Bible long enough and just dig into some of these things. You just go, this is just, it's just too good. It's just, it's just too good. It's how it is. So just a couple chapters prior, right? Where did we find Mordecai? We found Mordecai just given a bunch of directions to Esther. He wouldn't go in and see the king because he was wearing sackcloth and ashes. And the language we had was him going all through the city of Susa, just shouting, protesting, making a big stink hey, the Jews are going to die, this is unjust. And he's, he's protesting in sackcloth and ashes. That's where we see him just a couple chapters before. The sackcloth and ashes have been replaced by royal linen, blue and white and purple. He's wearing a gold crown. I mean, this is a total reversal in the story from just moments before where a 75-foot gallows was built to impale his body. I mean, the story has just completely flipped in another direction. You saw it last week in the pivot, and now the story is starting to race the other way. And while the king had to command people to bow to Haman, he walk, Mordecai walks out in his new duds, and the whole place erupts in celebration. They throw a party. They're like, yes, we got rid of the other doofus. Finally, somebody that knows what they're doing is in there. And, and the whole place erupts in a party. Mordecai's position, his promotion to this position of power, and the whole empire, they all celebrate. 
Now, what's interesting is that the NRSV uh, translation of the Bible, the New Revised Standard, it, it, it throws in, um, there's, a, there's another word here, but there's actually four, uh, four words that the NRSV uses to kind of signify this mood change that happens. Um, the four emotional reactions are these, these uh, emotions that come out of the Jewish people here in the NRSV are light or happiness, gladness, joy, and honor. Now, again, the story is mirroring off of itself. So if you go back to chapter 4 and verse 3, you also find four emotions. But the four emotions in chapter 4 and verse 3 are mourning, fasting, weeping, and, uh, and lamenting. So happiness, mourning, gladness, fasting, joy, weeping, honor, lamenting, they, they, they're just the exact opposite. The whole story is beginning to turn for the Jewish people. And once again, you would have to just pause and step back and say, even in God's silence, he has remembered his people. He's remembered his promises. He's not going to let them die. He's, he, he is still there. He is still at work. And as all the provinces receive this second decree that has showed up at the same time, they all start to go, all right, there's a lot of Jewish people in, the, in Persia. We're going to, uh, well, I'm a Jew too. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm one of those guys. Yeah, I like them. You know, there's this just complete reversal in how the provinces viewed them. Now, it's probably a fair conversation to have that the entire Persian empire doesn't have an issue with the Jewish people. They've been living there peacefully for generations, just doing what they're supposed to do. The guy that had the problem with them was the, uh, the Agagite who had generational beef with the Jewish people going all the way back to King Saul. So the reality is that all of Persia didn't necessarily hate the Jews or care. They just, they read these decrees and they're like, well, just in case. Yeah, I'm a Jew too. Look, <laughs> something begins to change. Now, whether they actually converted or whether they pretended is kind of up for debate. You could have your conversation about it to what you think actually happened. But at the end of the day, uh, the reality was when it came to Haman's decree and Mordecai's decree, there was no middle ground. You were either for the Jews or you were against the Jews. You, you either had a target on your back or you were able to defend your... I mean, there was, there was no middle ground between the two decrees. And so some of the people went, I'm with them. Like, I don't, I don't want any beef. I don't got any problem. I, I'm identifying with the Jewish people. And so here we sit at the end of chapter eight. And throughout the story, God has been silent. Again, this is the only book in the Bible that never mentions the name of God. He, he's, just, he's silent in the story. You, we have to find him hiding in plain sight in the story. And the Jewish people like us at, at times are probably asking a similar question that we've asked before. Has God forgotten us? Some of our people have gone home back to, uh, back to rebuild the wall and uh, the temple. Like these things are happening and we're stuck here in Persia and God is silent. Are we about to be extinguished? Has God forgotten us? But we are discovering that the answer to that question is a resounding no, God has not forgotten. He's not forgotten his people. He's not forgotten his promises. He's not forgotten you. So you could go all the way back and you could just see God hiding in plain sight the whole time as the story develops and as it pivots and goes the other way. You can find God hiding in plain sight in a beauty pageant that positions a Jewish woman as queen of the Persian empire. And you go, oh, coincidence in the coincidence of the roll of the dice to land the extermination date of the Jewish people on the 13th of March coincidence like or the confrontation with a generational enemy through Haman and in the edict to erase the Jewish people from Persia and to watch the two stories collide the two plots collide to, to watch Mordecai being raised to a position of power through humility and faithfulness and diligent work and good work. 
And to watch all that happen and to go, God has not forgotten. He remembers. He's there. He's at work. He's not named in the story, but he's there and he is clearly at work as all of these things are coming together and the whole story is reversing itself and the momentum is now headed in the right direction. God has not forgotten his people. He's not forgotten his promises. God has not forgotten you. He's not forgotten you. He's not clueless about you. He's not watching you go through life just silent and going, oh, I totally forgot about, totally forgot about Bill over there. I, oh, man, slipped my mind, you know? Like, God remembers you. And you can go all the way back to the book of Genesis and you can just start working your way through and you are going to find over and over and over and over that God remembers. Genesis chapter eight and verse one, God remembered Noah. Exodus chapter two and verse 24, he heard his people and remembered his covenant. Psalm chapter 78 and verse 39, God remembers that you're just a human. It actually says he remembers we are flesh and blood. He's like, oh yeah, I'm a little bit bigger than you. I remember who you are. You're a disaster walking. That's cool. I remember. I get it. I totally get it. You know, hot mess, hot mess thing. You know, like I get it. I know who you are. It's fine. I remember. God knows. And the theme continues well into the New Testament. You get to Luke chapter one and verse 72. In Luke chapter one and verse 72, uh, there's a, a guy by the name of Zechariah. And he's, uh, he's prophesying, he's, he's met this little baby Jesus, and he begins to prophesy. And what's fascinating is Zachariah's name means God remembers. And there in Luke chapter 1 and verse 72, he's, he's looking at little baby Jesus, and he's holding him, he's like, God remembered his covenant. It's finally happened. God remembered his people. It's finally here. It's the whole point of Jesus. God remembers his people, he remembers his promises, he remembers the covenant. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus concludes the Great Commission and says, I'm, I'm going to be with you always. You don't got to worry. I'm going to forget about you. I am with you always to the end of the age. Acts chapter 2, as the church is beginning to start and form, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, God says, I really don't want you to think I've forgotten you. Here's a present. <laughs> Holy Spirit, boom, you know, fire and languages and tongues and all this crazy stuff, earthquakes and wind and all this crazy stuff goes down. You got to kind of work your way through. But Acts chapter two, the beginning of the church, God goes, I haven't forgotten you. Here's a gift. The Holy Spirit will be with you to comfort you and lead you and guide you and like prompt you forward. I haven't forgotten you. We so often can start to feel like Man, it just feels like life is going a certain way for everybody else. God has been silent for far too long. And man, I just feel forgotten. I feel unseen. I feel forgotten in a rocky marriage, forgotten in a difficult friendship. Feel like there's a seemingly forgotten promise from God. Maybe it's a family relationship. I just think God has forgotten about me. I just think God overlooks me. I don't think he's followed through and he's been very silent as of late. I just want to offer you some encouragement. There is always hope even when God is silent. He remembers you. He knows you. He sees you. He is the God who remembers his people and remembers his promises. Let's pray. Father, we pause and we come before you and God, we admit that sometimes life doesn't go quite the way we thought it was going to. It's not quite doing what we thought it was going to. And we're, we're not where we want to be. And sometimes we wake up and we think, oh man, I, by this point in life, I really wanted to be here and at this place. And you know, whatever the things are. And sometimes God, we sense that we've tried to follow you, to obey you, to, to follow you into a calling, to follow you into an action. And then things don't go the way they're supposed to, or doesn't, not, at least to us, it just feels like it's off. And sometimes God, we admit that we think God's forgotten me. He's abandoned me. Father, for those who are in that place, who have been in that place, Father, would you help them to hear your voice in this moment? That you've not forgotten you remember your people. You remember your promises. You are the God who remembers. 
God, help people to know that they're seen, they're not overlooked, not forgotten in this story. Father, we love you so much. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, that Jesus is the one that just the ultimate example and story of we are not forgotten, we're not forsaken, we're not overlooked. God, help us to see Jesus in the moments we feel forgotten. Father, we love you so much. And we thank you again so much for your son, Jesus. It's all these things that we pray in his name. Amen. Thanks again for tuning in today to our podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow, subscribe, share, and watch for special episodes. For more information about LS Community Church, visit our website at lscckc.org or follow us on social media.